I would say it was kind of an exponential development. In the beginning, it was very, very slow and just singularly guys came in and tried to help us uh, bring everybody up to speed. And then uh, at a very quick pace, more and more of them came in. And, and also the, the operational capability of the squadron then exponentially became better. And one guy who really brought, I think, brought the squadron forward a lot was Spanky. Spanky was an American exchange pilot, a really brilliant instructor and very brilliant operational brain. And I could observe by that time I was already test pilot over here in Manching that he really brought the squadron forward a lot operationally with his ideas and his concepts and so forth. Mm -hmm. How did it yeah. play against the F-18s, the F-15s? Well, um, the principle was really simple. Uh, due to the fact that the radar of the MiG-29, it wasn't bad as such, but the human machine interface, it was so poor that it was extremely hard for the pilot to figure out what was going on 40 miles, 50 miles away from him. Whereas the F-15s, foremost, first and foremost, F-18s, F-16s, they had much better situational awareness due to their radars and so forth. And they also had a little bit superior weapons, whereas we were not fully clear at that time how good like the AA-10, the R-27, uh, radar guided missile really was. Anyway, um, it quickly turned out that what we needed to do with the MiG-29 is confuse the guys and trouble them in sorting out what we were doing until we ended up in the visual range. Mm -hmm. Once we were in the visual range, we were usually ending up as the winners because A, the MiG-29 was from its maneuvering potential more or less equal uh, to the Western types. Plus, we had a system that was superior to what the others had, and that was the R-73 missile, in Western terms, air-to-air-11, together with the helmet-mounted display. Mm -hmm. The Russians had that already in the early 1980s. Everybody in the West was surprised, and it was a brilliant system, because you needed not point your aircraft to the adversary, but within about a 45 degree left and right uh, angle, it sufficed to turn your head, superimpose a symbol on your helmet mounted display with the enemy, assign a missile, hear the tone, fire the missile, and the missile would go there and kill him before he could even acquire you. And that was such a huge advantage that was a bad surprise for the Americans and everybody else uh, that gave us a really big advantage in the visual in the visual arena, or as the Americans put it, in the phone booth. And everybody, nobody wanted to meet us in the phone booth because no. that's where we were, we were good at. I think one of the biggest hindrances for the Big Twenty Nine was the smoky engines. Does this really affect it in combat? To some degree, certainly, because of course, when you select reheat, the fuel consumption goes up very quickly. Plus, you accelerate very quickly to high transonic or supersonic speeds. So yeah, of course, you always have to think, do I use reheat or not? When you don't use it, you're visible to others earlier than if you weren't smoking. It was a similar thing on the Air Force. So yes, it's a disadvantage, but I don't know whether it was so major. I couldn't really tell you. It's a factor, but I do not think it's a real big factor. Mm -hmm. So I have to ask for our British viewers, did you ever go up against um, the tornadoes or the RAF in the MiG-29? We went up against everything, uh, in particularly part three and four of uh, the operational testing we did. And I remember we had ferried the airplanes from Preschen to Wittmund for building block number two. And we told everybody, hey guys, we are going to test our MiG-29s here and we want, let me call it clean conditions, we want to do our stuff without anybody disturbing us and we will work from then to then in this and this area. And guess what happened? We entered the area and the first guys who came in were British Air Force wow. jumping us uh, against all agreements and stuff, you know. But I mean, they were initially we were a bit angry because they were sort of hindering us from doing what we intended to do. And then we ended a very short engagement with them. And it was amazingly simple with the MiG-29. Mm -hmm. 
to maneuver against airplanes like the Tornado. The Tornado, when they did their best in a defense turn, it was for you just like you flew a rejoin, you know, on a guy for formation flying. It was real easy, incredibly easy. A little bit harder on the F4, but uh, then, of course, against an F16, F18, those were at the same level. But to us as Phantom pilots, it all seemed so easy in the beginning against second generation jets. Yes, we did that quite a bit. Uh, when we did missile firing in the Irish Sea uh, from Valley in 1993, I, I was there. I wasn't allowed to fire. The test pilots from here did it. But I was an observer from the squadron and uh, I was interested in what they were doing and I supported them a little bit when they had problems with the systems or whatever. And uh, what I got to do at that time was fly sorties against uh, the British operational testers on Tornados, on Phantoms, on F3s, everything. And they were extremely professional. I learned a lot about the MiG-29 from them because they understood some systems very, very well. So yes, I flew against them. At that time, I did what they wanted because they wanted to acquire information and data and stuff. But I think uh, their operational testers were at a very, very high standard of knowledge and competence.